got something that you're wanting from the Father today. Just lift up your head and ask him. He said, if you ask, you shall receive. Whatever it is between you and God, you know what your heart desires today. He's waiting to give you the answer. God, we just claim we that victory you we today. You we God's claim way. what we came for, God. Hallelujah. In the we mighty praise name you of we Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. You may be seated. Isn't he wonderful to keep working? 
his place he's changing us to see his nature revealed in us we are growing from a servant to a hesitated so I know you had something powerful for them. That'd be fine. Okay. While some guys are moving some of those McDonald's things. You can do that. Uh, before I start somebody go get Moran. I think she's doing our redneck lemon juice this morning. <laughs> He'll snap to it when you say Introduce 
the stars and he tells the sun when to shine and he kisses the flowers each morning with dew but he parking lot. We, it costs a little more money, almost $10,000 that little spot because the, the rules and regulations makes it make it deeper for the cement lot deeper for that area. But, you know, we saved for it. We had it. Paid cash. Ain't that a good way to go? No note at the bank? Amen. Uh, Biker Sunday is July the 11th. If anybody does not have one of these, please Stick up your hand real high, and a star will get you one. <laughs> Stick your hand back up. Amen. Come right on in, folks. might give these folks one. They may not have one. Just come in. All right. Thank you, Star. You're a star today and forevermore, right? <laughs> Amen. You see a biker, make sure you 
give them one. Amen. So, since all you young people sitting here remember about after we, uh, we're going to have a prayer for the men at the end. After that, you all can run back to the class, okay? Star, you stay in here. You guys are adults. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for a great day today. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We just thank you, Father, that your word will go forth today and it'll do the job that you sent it to do. I thank you, Lord. You said your word will not return void. And though we may not read a whole bunch of scriptures, but Lord, we thank you that the words that we say that are in harmonize will always harmonize with your word. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. As most of you know, if you've been around our ministry a long time, I hardly ever talk about fathers on Father's Day, and I don't talk about moms on Mother's Day, and I don't talk about Easter on Easter, but today we're going to talk about fathers. So I'm going to break my mold. Sometimes we do it, but uh, I want to talk about the importance of a godly father. The importance of a godly father. First of all, what is godly? In the Old Testament, according to my strong concordance, it meant good and merciful. In the New Testament, it says exceedingly Godward. So a godly father is always going to do things in harmony with God. Now as a father, some I don't know if the rest of you will join with me, but we, we miss it miserably sometimes. I heard a guy say just recently, he pastored a large church, and he said uh, when, he, when his kids was little, he said, I'd get real, real low. Uh, blunt and um, brash with my wife and I'd raise my disciples and he said as soon as I did it I knew I shouldn't do it but sometimes I'd get my wife aside and I'd say Debbie you know please forgive me <clears throat> but he said sometimes I didn't have time for her to come aside but he said I'd get down on one knee he said I had three girls and I'd get things and girls, bring those girls together and put my arm around them and say listen I just spoke harshly to your mother. And I and he said, I looked up to her and said, please forgive me. And he said, I'd tell my kids, you forgive me too. Because I love your mother and I'm committed to her the rest of my life. And he said, I always waited for response from my girls. Because if there's no response, they're probably not forgiven and they'll carry that on. So sometimes he would ask them, they'd say, you're, you're okay, Dad. You're all right. We forgive you. But he said, I always did that. So I'm going to sh use God as the perfect father today. And I'm going to use Jesus, the son, as a perfect son. I want to use that as my principle. Although I'll read all those scriptures, will not pertain necessarily to what I'm talking about, but it'll be an example. Will that be all right? So we learned, uh, I think two years ago, I did speak on fathers, about fathers. We learned four things about a father. You know, God was never a, known as a father until he created something. Once he created something, he became a father. But all through the Old Testament, he is never known as a father until Jesus comes along. And then the whole world begins to know God as a father and Jesus as a son. We sung a song today that what God is bringing us to is we're not slaves and worms and dust, we're really sons of God. And you know, a son in a slave uh, environment, a son has a, is a different standing than a slave. Right? So we have, God has brought us in and made us all sons and daughters, kings and priests unto God today, in today's world. So we find out a father is number one, he's the foundation. And anybody that was here two years ago remember what another another definition was. Ellie is here. Do you remember? You don't. Okay, I'm gonna remind you. The father is also a source. She was here. Sustainer. All right. He's a sustainer. And he's also the protector. That's the job of a father. Think about God. 
He's our foundation, isn't he? In the beginning, was it was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Old Testament says it another way. In the beginning was what? He created something. He created the heavens and the earth. So he's the foundation. He is the source. So trickle that down to dads today. We're the foundation of our family. We're also the source. We're the sustainer. Moms are helping. <laughs> and what all I say about dads today, I'm not excluding you moms. Moms has their place. Dads have their place. Crystal made mentioned this morning, she said, Did I get a ticket? Because she said, I'm both mom and dad. <laughs> and I said, well, <clears throat> Grandpa's dad. And she said, yeah, I'm Uncle Mike. <laughs> but anyway, uh, not me, but her brother Mike. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and I'll, I'll take that too, though. Anyway, but moms have a special place, and moms have an innate something in them by God that men just don't have. When Linda was babysitting the kids, little kids, Emmy and Ellie and some, or uh, L, Emmy and JJ, right? I'd be talking on the phone and I'd say, I could hear them screaming. I said, Linda, take care of those kids. She said, they're all right. And other times, she'd say, hold I got to go. They're hurt. Just all sound like the same scream to me. But moms know the difference. Grandmas know the difference. It's a whole different something that God just put in them. One church I was pastoring, this young lady came to me and she said, she was dating a guy and she said, uh, she wanted to get married, but she said, I want to, want to counsel with you first. And I said, why don't you counsel with your dad first? Now, here's the story. Her dad and her hadn't talked in 20 years. She had already been, had several kids and, and uh, anyway, she hadn't talked in several, 20 years to her dad. She only lived like five blocks from him. She talked to her mom all the time, but she never did talk to her dad. And uh, she had run away from home and took up with some guy. And, you know, she's telling me about one, one time she literally jumped out of the car because she thought he was going to kill her as they was going down the road. She said, the one that didn't kill me. She said, it was in an uh, exit, and he was slowed down for that exit, and I just bailed. And she said, I, I was pretty honored too. She said, I understand why Dad uh, didn't like me. I said, well, uh, she said, I don't want to talk to my dad. He don't care. I said, I'm not counseling you and your boyfriend until you talk to your dad. She said, do I have to? I said, yeah, if you want my counsel. I said, here's what you do. Go down and tell your dad. You've just been a real bad rear end. I didn't use that term, but <laughs> I didn't use the worst one. But <laughs> I said, just tell him you've been a rear end of yourself to him. And ask him to forgive you. And then tell him, you're going to get married. You want to get married. You'd like his counsel. I said, sit on his lap. Now, this gal's 35 years old or so. I said, sit on his lap. Put your arm around his neck and tell him you've just been a rear end. And forget asking to forgive you. So, next time I talked to her, I said, how'd it go? She really drug her feet on that. She said, well, first of all, I didn't sit on his lap. And I said, okay. I said, what else did you do? She said, I told him just what you told me to tell him. I said, what was his response? She said, he took me in his arms. And he hugged me. And we both sobbed for probably ten minutes. And he said, just looked at me and he says, Sis, has your boyfriend been good to you or has ever slapped you? He said, Yeah, he slapped me a couple of times. I said, Don't marry him. She went ahead and married him. He was very abusive. And they got a divorce. But when she came back to me, I said, I don't need to counsel you. Your dad gave you the best advice. Something about dads, even though his dad, her dad wasn't what we call a Christian. There's something about dads that have an innate ability put in there by God that moms just don't have in that area. But moms have things that dads don't have. 
So put them together. That's why a household with mom and dad is so crucial because dad has things he can offer. Mom has things that she can offer. Put it together and you'll have a good church. Amen. Science teaches us that within the loins of a man, there's four generations. Now the Bible kind of brings that out in the Old Testament. It talks about the sins of the father down to the fourth generation. So, you know, whatever your dad, your grandpa, your great-grandpa was, sometimes that just passes down. We call that a familiar spirit. It ain't a demon spirit necessarily. It's a familiar spirit. It comes from family. It's so important that we understand the, really the role of a father. The number one crisis globally is the abuse of a father's role model. Now, I read this two years ago, but I hunted it out and found it. Since I don't throw nothing away. <laughs> but it took me a while. But I'm going to read it again. This is research from Time Magazine from a group of psychiatrists, psychologists, and social scientists. Number one, more than any other factor, the biological father in a family will determine a child's success and their destiny, more than any other thing. Now, there's other things contribute to it, but that's the most. 38% of all children in the West live without a biological father. That's their studies. I didn't make it up. More than one half of today's children spend their childhood without a, thank you, without a father. David Blankenberg's book on confirming our most important problem in America, he said, you should think, you would think it would be drugs, gangs, and guns. Here's what his book said. He said, fatherlessness is the most destructive trend of our generation ahead of drugs, ahead of abuse, ahead of teen pregnancy, ahead of incest, ahead of rape, and ahead of gun violence. Fatherlessness is ranks over all of that. Time Magazine went on to say, the absence of fathers is linked to most social nightmares, from boys with guns to girls with babies. Went on to say, 49% of all families with children headed by a single mother live below the poverty line, compared to only 8% with two parents in the home. This study is linking poverty, is linking poverty to the absence of a father, not the lack of money. Let me stop and insert this. I believe this survey took place in 1999. It's probably worse now. Social studies say that 40% of all prison inmates that live without a father is a pr positive predictor of criminal activity more than race and more than poverty. Social science is what Time Magazine, that's not a Christian magazine, that's just Time Magazine says, social sciences have found a link that, found a link that homes without a father contribute to dropout, suicide, drug addiction, joblessness, mental illness, and target for sexual activity and incest. That's from Time Magazine in 1999. Now, I'm not pointing anything out. I don't know. I don't know your heart, but most men in America will quietly admit that his father was not a good role model. Ladies, listen to me. Ella, don't forget you. She might take a note on this. You must understand that the guy you want to marry most likely is suffering from father absenteeism. When you give him a baby and this young man don't have no idea how to be a father or a dad. You can't demand from a man what he cannot 
no. It's tough in today's world to be a man. You know why? Manhood in our Western society and TV displays men as immature boys. What if TV would project men, all the TV shows would predict men as founders, foundations, and sources, and sustainers, and protectors. And they portray dads as beer gut buffoons. Young ladies, you can make it better or worse for your future husband. If your husband never had a father role model, he gets angry, and then you have domestic violence. Studies show one of the most common statements from a man in all of these studies was, Woman, what do you want from me? What he's really saying, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. He stuck because he never had a role model, no training. What to do as a father, what to do as a husband. So he responds after pressures put on him, he responds with anger, and sometimes that anger turns to physical abuse. What do you do if your father was a failure? You say, my dad was not a good role model. You can start now, you can change that. That's what the Holy Ghost is for. That's what Jesus is for. That's what the power of the Spirit's for. I want to read Matthew 5, 48. Jamie will put it on the screen for us there. Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfect doesn't mean flawless. Now, in his case, it, it was flawless. But in our case, be ye therefore what, perfect. What would be another word for perfect? Mature. Be, be therefore mature, even as your Father which is in heaven is mature. I see grown men. I trucked for 45 years and I see grown men spend time just playing video games, truck stops, like little kids. And their, their load gets there late and they get fired. And they wonder what went wrong. That's just one of many, 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 many examples. I see men and women with kids in the store and the the dad acts more like a kid than the the kid does. Y'all missed a good chance to say amen. (laughs) Haven't you seen that? I, I seen a little child one time sitting on a toy in Walmart just riding that thing up and down the aisle and I said to the, the what do you call them now uh, Linda they run zone manager or whatever it is uh, what no whoever managed that area department manager thank you <laughs> get me out of this dilemma here <laughs> I went to the department manager and I said do you ever want to just choke these kids they said oh she said no not at all I want to choke their parents <laughs> That tell them that moms and dads didn't, you know, we went, went someplace, before I ever got the car, mom and dad said, don't be touching nothing. Don't be doing this. They give us orders before we ever got out of the car. Amen, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You don't have to be like your earthly father if he was absent or abusive. I want to give you an example. Buddy Harrison uh, preached a camp meeting for us when we was in Salem. His da- his father-in-law was Kenneth Hagin. And Buddy told me, he said, when I got saved, or when I come into the just the understanding of salvation, he says, my dad was an alcoholic, and I just, I hated that. I hated, he wasn't a good role model. He wasn't a good dad to us. Always drunk when we needed him most. But he said, if I got depressed, I found myself going to the liquor store and getting me a drink. Here I was, I had understood, Lord lived my heart, understood Jesus. That was my understanding. 
He said, I felt so bad. And he said, I'd repent. And, you know, later, a few years later, he got married to Brother Hagin's daughter. And he said, I still did that once in a while. When, I, when a pressure was on, I'd go, I'd go drink. And he said, when I'd come out of the liquor store, I'd say to myself, like father, like son. He said, I'd just go to a park and I'd just go get drunk. My dear wife put up with that for a while. He said, but one day as he, he went out in the liquor store, he said, like father, like son. And he said, God spoke up in me and said, yeah, like your heavenly father. He said, it never occurred to me. I do have a heavenly father. He said, I drove out to that same park and I just broke that bottle over a rock. He said, I never took another drink. Because I started understanding my, my earthly father wasn't a good role model, but my heavenly father is perfect. I can follow him. He said, that, just learning that helped me in my times of trouble. You can take God's heavenly standard and apply it to the earth today in your walk of life. How do you know when a father's a good dad? Generally by his kids. I want to read you some things I jotted down here. Attributes of a good father. Number one is identity. The average man struggles with identity. Identity is what you get from your father. If a man has no identity, then he's unidentified. Think about that. When a man has no identity, he'll be like somebody else. Now, I might be behind on the times. I just remember Nike and Calvin Klein. But they'll go buy Nikes or Calvin Klein clothes to be like someone else that they're not. I don't know what the name brands are today, but that's that kind of dates me, I guess. Why does kids want a $200 pair of tennis shoes? Because his dad never gave him an identity. He's trying to identify with somebody else. Sometimes they'll wear their hair like somebody else. Or they'll join a gang just so they can be identified. You may wonder, just don't go away, I'm going to do something right now. That's all right. Come here. You wonder why every Sunday I come in and I say, love you. I try to give these people identity. You know, I'm not their dad or their husband or their uncle or cousin. Now you do what you need to do. <laughs> I'm not any of that. But I try to give people and somebody to identify with to understand God loves you just you might not have had a, a, a role, good dad for a role model, but you got the Heavenly Father who loves you. He loves you when you're down. He loves you when you're up. He loves you when you're mad. He loves you when you're happy. You know, it don't change. That's why a lot of people talk like a dog. Their husband or wife might be up like a roller coaster. I mean, mad today and, you know, a whole lot. But. I heard a guy say, you know, even when I come in from school, if I had a bad day, my dog was wagging his tail and he'd come to me. If I was mad, the dog wagged his tail and come to me. Didn't matter what my mood was, the dog didn't change. It's a sad state of affairs when dogs represent God better than us dads. Amen. I'm not saying get rid of your dogs or that. <laughs> or your cats, you cat lovers, or you know, whatever. Amen. If a man don't have a role model, he'll be changing all the time. Science calls that schizophrenic, but <laughs> I'm just saying. He'll be one thing on Monday and something else on Tuesday and Wednesday, and Thursday's nice, and Friday's lovely, and Saturday's a beast. He's confused about the concept of his true self. He has no idea. God lives in here. 
if we have the concept that God and we can instill in our men, our young men, that God lives in you, son. Whatever you do, please God. Us dads have a tendency, and moms too, for that matter, to tell our kids, "What do you want to do in life?" And I've said that to a lot of kids. What we should be saying, what do you think God wants you to do? If you do what God wants you to do, it's going to be a whole lot better and it won't be quite so much upstream for you if you do what God wants you to do. And what God wants you to do is what you're good at now. My daughter, my granddaughter, Bailey, is a checker at uh, Aldi's. But we see in her a trait. She loves young people she loves kids she was sick and couldn't go to work but she had a friend that was sick and so she she didn't have no medicine so she takes her aspirin or he takes her Advil or whatever it is she drives 30 40 miles when she should just stay there and Lynn and I have talked about it she has an innate ability to love kids and others so her Skills is going to be probably in people. Probably not checking at Aldi's. But she's confused, and we keep we keep talking to her. And sometimes you kids, you got to wait for the right moment. Sometimes you got to create it. <laughs> but when we don't know who our true self is, we have no idea idea that we are created in the image of God. The Father provides, and this is dads and grandpas, you provide the model and the imitators of God for your kids. The Bible says, be imitators of God as dear children. John 5, 19, James. <clears throat> then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Kids will follow their father, maybe not in the same career path, but they'll follow a faithfulness. I, you know, I wanted Daryl to be a, a trucker. In our first trucks, I had Mike and Daryl Cronk on it. Now, he never invested a penny, but he was still in school. But I did that to hold his attention. He was dating a girl and he drove up to the apartment and she looked up and said, I didn't know you was in trucking. He didn't tell him no difference. <laughs> but it kept his attention. 1993, I bought a Peterbilt. And we, and this is, I-49 was just called 71 then. And uh, I said, Daryl, I want you to drive this truck. So he gets in, I show him the gear pattern, and we get, he just gets in about top gear, and he just starts easing over the shoulder. I said, son, what's wrong? He said, dad, let's get one thing straight. I ain't never going to be a truck driver. <laughs> and I said, that's fine. I got out, went around there, and we just drove all the way down to Peculiar. I turned around and come back and parked. We were parking then over on Blue Ridge. <laughs> and uh, I said, follow your dreams. What's God put in your heart? Follow that. And he has pretty well. It's another reason why so many young men struggle. Their fathers went to the club. That was what was natural for their dad. Their dad slapped their mom. That was what was natural. Girls, you're looking for a husband, check them out. Check how their father acted. He's most likely going to be like his daddy. Young ladies, let me tell you. What his father does or does not do is most likely what he'll bring into your life. After about, see, next month will be 48 years of ministry for us. This statement I've heard more from women that are having struggles with an abusive husband or an absent husband. I thought I could change him. I thought I could change him. Look for what God's doing in somebody's life while you're dating. I mean, dating's almost out of style. Now you just say, smile at you, take them home with you, you know? That's not God's plan. Date 
learn what they like, what they don't like, see how they treat their mother. I always tell <coughs> tell kids, I say, listen, when you're dating, does he buy your meal? Now listen, Daryl, or not Daryl, Preston, <laughs> was real frugal. Uh, I, I kind of attribute a lot of that to myself, but I used to take him on the truck and I'd pay him to unhook my hoses when I unhooked the truck. And I just stand and had a lot of book work to do. And I showed him how to do that and how to crank down the landing gears. So he'd jump out. And when he was real little, he'd crank him landing gears down and unhook. I'd pay him a little bit. And uh, anyway, I said, just jump back out of the way, even if it's dark. I never had to worry about it. He was always out of the way. And I'd just pull out and we'd go to the next trailer. And he'd, he'd crank up the landing gear. And he'd hook my hoses back up. He knew which one went where. And he'd jump in the truck. And I was probably still doing paperwork. <coughs> And at Ottawa, Kansas, the, the dispatcher dispatched from there then instead of Bentonville, but at that time they... And these guys would go up to the window and tell the, the dispatcher, give Mike those one-dock stores. Because we had to pull a trailer in, unhook it, go around and pull a trailer out of the dock, unhook it, hook back up to our loaded trailer, put it on the dock, unhook from that, go back and hook up to our empty trailer. He said, give Mike all them one-dock stores because he pays that boy. <laughs> he makes more money than they did, which I didn't care. Preston was doing it all. But anyway, so a few years of that, and I, he could eat like a man then. And I figured how much it cost me to take him with me. So I, one day I said, Preston, I'm going to give you a raise. He said, all right. How much? And I said, well, I figured it out. It'll be all right. But here's a kicker. You've got to buy your own food. <clears throat> now, listen, when we was at Walmart dis Distribution Center, they had a, a wall as long as from that door all the way to here. All of them, all that wall was just full of vending machines. When we walked in that door, he said, Grandpa, can I get a Pop-Tart? And I said, yeah, 75 cents. I gave him 75 cents. And I'd go up to the window, get my bills, and he'd donate that. And he said, can I have one for the road? And I said, yeah, I'll give him 75 more. He'd get one for the road. So we, he got to say, could I have two for the road, you know? <laughs> so we did that. Well, I figured all this in. And I, I said, you got to buy your own food. Now listen, when we stopped to eat, it wasn't no hamburger. <laughs> we got we got the whole meal, you know, tenderloin and potatoes and gravy. We always got a dessert and a tall Dr. Pepper. And that's okay. I'm building a legacy, so I really didn't care. After we started, <laughs> started paying him, and he had to buy his own food. We had him in a uniform. He had a Walmart uniform. looked like a miniature driver. <clears throat> anyway, so he got his own ticket. And I said, don't forget pie and ice cream. He said, oh, I don't need any. <laughs> don't forget your tall Dr. Pepper. He said, no, just water's fine. <laughs> so we'd get into Walmart. I said, don't forget your Pop-Tarts. He said, I ain't even hungry, Grandpa. <laughs> I was trying to. I did teach him the value of that, and then one weekend he got he we come home and he got Sherry told him to do something. And he got mad, and kicked her vacuum sweeper and broke it. She just got him with arms. Said, "You got money? You're going to store. You're going to buy me a new vacuum sweeper." And I said, "Sherry, that's the best thing you could have done." From that day to this, he's a very good with money. He told me that he's got a beautiful home in Lee Summit. Tell me the other day, he said, Grandpa, I don't know. Oh, he's got three vehicles, the fanciest golf cart you can possibly buy. It's got AC in it and the doors on it and all that stuff. He said, Grandpa, I don't owe for anything except my home. And we're paying that off early. See, he's been he's becoming a foundation to his little family. He's being a source for his little family. Ladies, young ladies especially, be diligent about your search for a boy that you think you might marry sometime. Your qualifier shouldn't be how good he can kiss. Your qualifier should be how, how good was his father. Because he's going to be like his father, except he gives his life to Jesus.
that can change that. I'll make that exception. Number two, heritage, another attribute of a godly father. Heritage always comes from the father. Luke 12, 32, Jamie. I'll let you find the scriptures. You'll be faster than I am. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell, tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures. That's not the scripture I wanted. Is that 1232? Okay. Can you pull up 12? And I might have... That might be my fault. Norm wants these scriptures ahead of time, so I sent them to him, but... Uh, he told me one day, he said, I've learned you. When he came, you know, he said, I've been Catholic all my life. He said, I don't even know the books of the Bible. He said, you have to be patient. And he said, he said now I'm kind of learning you guys kind of go by the Spirit, don't you? <laughs> you don't do it always in the right order. <laughs> okay. There we go. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, young ladies, young men. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you things too. Where did LeBron go? Huh? I need him out here. Can can he? Is he helping her with something? Okay, that's all right. That's all right, sis. If he's helping back there, that's all right. Huh? Just checking, sis. Okay. Listen, these these kind of messages are important for our kids. So important for our kids. Ron has a uh, has had a real struggle with just parents, moms and dads. So I really wanted to. I'm not using this message to beat him. I'm in, using this message to encourage him. Fathers, what do you have to give to your children? Is it cars, boats, guns, things, or a business? Number three, trust. Fathers create trust. Fathers must be trusted by their children. We hear stories on the news all the time about a man who took advantage of his little girl. Can you, as a dad, can you trust your children if you've had a business for 40 years to give it to them? If they lose it in 40 months... That's a good sign they weren't trained well. Look at John 5, 46. Did you give me the wrong one there? 540, 536, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bless his heart. He probably was fishing. <laughs> okay, John 5, 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Again, I'm just using this as a principle. The principle is the Father is a foundation. He's a source. He's a sustainer. He's a protector. But somewhere in life, we ought to have something to give to our children. The Bible even talks about having an inheritance for your children and your children's children. I got a lot of hurrying up to do <laughs> for that to be. To be. <clears throat> Number four, work. Work is another attribute of a godly father. A good father teaches his children to work, which includes vision and purpose. This week, well, I'm, this week I was. Uh, Spoke several times at a at a camp in down on Piney River, got ate up by the gnats. <laughs> and uh, uh, do you remember the Woods boys, Steve and, and uh, Paul Woods? He used to play for David Allen Co. I said, "What are you all doing playing for him?" They said, "Oh, that was our mission field. They're dynamic preachers and dynamic musicians." <clears throat> anyway, down there in the, they had this camp, and I spoke there a few times and. <coughs> While I was there, I remembered I used to work at Waynesville for Triple K Trucking. That's the old man's name was Keith. The son's name was oldest son was Keith. 
and the other son was named Kevin. And we parked our trucks at the end of the day right across from the bank, a big parking lot. I was still down there. Parking lot was still there. Only thing they got it asphalt in now, and, and there's old, just no gravel parking lot. We parked the dump trucks there. The, the dad was the mechanic, and Keith and Kevin both drove, and I drove. So we, us three boys was the driver for these three trucks. One night when we parked our trucks, the banker, I remember this, when I was still working there, the banker come out and said, Hey, Kevin, I need to see you. We're just, you know, we're dump trucking, we're hauling asphalt, we're not got no suit clothes on or nothing. So he walks up to the bank, and uh, so we, I parked my car down at his dad's house, and he said, where's Kevin? Or Keith? I said, the bank guy called him. He went up there. So Kevin told me, he said, when he went, when he went, left the bank and went down to his dad's house, his dad said, what what they want for you? What they want from you? He said, they wanted to hire me. He said, what'd you tell them? I told them I wasn't interested. Here's a dad. Here's a father. Here's a foundation. Here's a source. Dad said, you march your little self right back up there and tell them you are interested. He said, I bought the trucks. I keep them maintained. You drive them. Plus, I paid for your college education. You have a master's degree in uh, business administration. You march your little self right back up there and tell them you are interested. So, I went back up there and said, well, I've been talking to Dad. <laughs> I guess I am interested. His dad told him, though, he said, you work there six months, and if you don't like it in six months, the trucks will still be here. He told me the other day, he said, I've been here 40 years this month. Here's, here's something even better. I don't know, he, he didn't tell me all the process, but he must have got himself on the board. Because he said, I went to a board meeting after several years being there. And the, at the end of the board meeting, the, the owner of the bank said, I've sold this bank to Commerce Bank in St. Louis. And uh, so that, that was the end, of the end of the board meeting. So Keith said, when I left out of that board meeting, I went straight to his office. He said, Mike, my heart was fluttered. He said, I don't know why I said this. And I said, I want to buy this bank. He had that paper, throwed that paper over to him. He said, well... You think I'll give you four? I'll give you thirty days to come with four point four million. That's what it'll take to buy it. He said, "My heart just about beat out of my chest." He always conversed with his father. I texted him this morning, and I said, "Keith." He told me. He said his dad told him to buy the bank too. He had a chance to buy it. And uh, he said, my dad passed away the next day. That's the last words I, I heard him say. He texted this to me after I got to church this morning. <clears throat> he said, he came into my office about 4.30 and asked me what I thought about buying the bank. The option was just offered three days before. By then, I was really scared. It was too big for, for a 37-year-old with three, three kids and a wife. He said, his dad said, Son, I believe in you. You can do it. Just go for it and make it work. These are the last words he spoke to me when he passed at 7.30 the next morning. He went on to say, a father's belief in me, great words, that still leads me today. God, great seeing you this week, Mike, God bless you. And he went on to say, the bank was a small country bank of $35 million in assets in 1993. Today, it's nearly $140 million in size 
over four times bigger with three more banks. He put all from the guidance of a diesel mechanic who loved the Lord. His dad wasn't a banker, but he believed in him. His dad was a mechanic, a wonderful mechanic. The transformation went out of a semi. He'd put it in that night while you went home, and the next morning he'd have a new clutch, pressure plate, and transformation in the truck, and you're ready to go the next morning. He said, good advice from an old diesel mechanic who loved the Lord. His path was different than Keith's path. But his advice was still the same. I love that. I sat there when he told me. That I was at tears and he did too. He could hardly tell me. The good father will teach his children how to work and enjoy it. My dad was so good at, he didn't have a degree, but he had something in him that he would identify, he would make me identify it my work was something that was pleasurable for me. He'd always say, son, go get the truck. I, you know, they got pictures of me driving a load of logs, a log truck. It didn't have no no doors on it, no seat belt, big load of logs. And Mom was standing down with a chicken house when I come around the corner of that big load of logs and I was just 12 years old. I can't hardly imagine a 12-year-old doing that today. <laughs> you know? But I worked, but Dad made it something that I enjoyed so but he he, he made trucks run in my blood I think <laughs> oh man John 5 17 Jesus answered them my father worketh here unto and I work lazy dad lazy children Complaining father, complaining children. You know, I shared with you last few weeks about Moses, and he said, in Numbers chapter 20, he said, I believe it was Numbers, he said, uh, the fathers ate sour grapes. It's what you do when you cry. <laughs> Excuse me. Bible says the in children in the wilderness wandering said the fathers ate sour grapes. That really doesn't mean they come to a, a vineyard and the grapes wasn't right yet. It's a it's a proverb, and he said the kids' teeth are set on edge. In other words, if dads complain, kids are going to complain. If dads are lazy, guess what? Kids are going to be lazy. Some men go to work and never see any results. Nothing improves. Nothing happens. One of the best things your kids can say about you is, my father is a hard worker. John 17, 4 and 5. I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the what? Work which thou gavest me to do. You know, there's one thing Dad taught me. Don't quit till it's done. Just because somebody drives up in a hot rod car, don't jump off the mower till the yard's mowed. Amen? Don't quit till you finish. He even did that in, in playing music. we me and my sister and dad be playing music. She played the piano. Dad play some instrument, a guitar, mandolin, fiddle, piano or something. I'd be playing the guitar. And mom would say, supper's ready. Dad said, we ain't finished. In other words, we're not going to quit in the middle of a chorus. We're going to sing the chorus till it's in. Then we'll come to supper. He always said this for you that like music. We haven't come to a cadence yet. We ain't come to a stopping point. We'd hurry up. Well, I wanted to eat, so. <laughs> Amen. I remember, uh, how many ever listened to, to Dave Ramsey? All right. Heard Dave Ramsey on, on TV, or on TV, on radio a long time ago said this. Said a lady had called him 
And she had been a bookkeeper for this big firm for years and years and years. And they were merging with somebody else and that or selling out and they didn't need her anymore. They had their own people. And she was just upset. She cried and was calling Dave Ramsey. What do I do? He said, how long was you a bookkeeper? She said, well, I was there so many years, 26 years, whatever. He said, so you have bookkeeping skills, right? She said, oh, yeah. He said, start your own business. So she, he encouraged her. She started being a bookkeeper for these little companies. And she had enough little companies. She was making more money than she made working for the big company. So, your crisis, let it become your opportunity. Let it become your opportunity. One thing about it, if you've done something a lot of years, if they fire you, they didn't fire your brain. Everything that you thought, no, and your skills are still there. You know what, there's people making money this week. While other people, their same age, is sitting watching TV, wondering why they're successful and they're not. Just get out and do something. I heard Dave Ramsey say this myself. I heard him say this. There's a single mother called in. She had several children. She said, I, got, I can't hardly go to work because my babysitting's too high, but I really want to work. He said, hey, sweetheart, can you make cookies? She said, yeah, I can make a good cookie. He said, make a dozen. If you got cat in the house, dogs in the house, put them out. Don't know dog hair, cat hair in any of your food. Put your uh, net over your head and make some real good, clean cookies. Have your kids to take them to a neighbor. And tell your kids to tell the neighbor, hey, if you like them, Tell somebody and mom will make them for, give them a price. And she did that. He said, if somebody wants them, now next week you make two dozen and do the same thing. And the next week make three dozen. Well, I've heard that same story. I heard that call in, but many, many weeks later he referred to it again. When I was trucking, I listened to him religiously every day. And, uh, her business so thrived in making cookies, she got her kids involved. She taught them a business. You know, just pass it down. You don't have to just sit home and say, there's nothing for me to do. Yesterday, uh, Sherry Cisco called, well, she called me a month ago, wanted me to move trailers for her. <clears throat> she has about, I don't know, 15 fireworks trailers that she has a, a, a warehouse on the back of her property on just to move them from the warehouse out they don't have to get on the street just move them around to her big her big tent over there on the homes and 58 but her boy rode with me he cranked the landing gears down and he hooked up my hoses and I wouldn't tell him about this and we got a trailer too hot too low and he was about crying I said hold it hold it hold it <clears throat> I have a dump valve on this truck. I backed up to it, and that I let my air out of my airbags in the truck, and the truck just went down like that, and I backed up under it, put the air to it to raise that trailer up. I said, now crank it up. He said, boy, I'm learning lots of stuff. And uh, teased him, uh, taught him a lot of things that day. And I said, you know, one of these days, your mom is not going to be able, mom and daddy's not going to be able to do this. You can take over this business. He said, you know, I'm trying to learn all I can. That was Nick. Or no, not Nick. Nathan. Nathan. He said, I'm trying to learn all I can. The other boy, I'm not sure about it. <laughs> Carl, I can tell you about that. <laughs> anyway, another story. There was a, a pastor in the state of Washington. Had a young man come in and uh, got saved and really was on fire for the Lord. And he wanted to preach. And the pastor said, I'll tell you what. I'll start you out. I want you to just clean the bathroom." He said, but I really want to preach. He said, I understand. I will make a place for that, but I want you to clean the bathrooms. He said, but I want them really done well. So that boy cleaned the bathrooms and went to work doing that, and after several weeks, the people were telling the pastor, who's cleaning the restrooms now? I have never seen them so squeaky clean. So 
he told him who it was. And anyway, I'll cut the long story down to this version real short. He got he done that so good while he was waiting to get to preach. And the pastor would let him speak once in a while. But he started getting business. When he started preaching, he had 15 trucks and 15 employees running all over Seattle cleaning restrooms everywhere. Wonderful business, a profitable business, just from a pastor that was wise who said, start cleaning the restrooms. Number five, another attribute, and I'm about finished, credibility. Fathers transfer credibility and reputation to their children. Number six is vision. A father imputes vision to his children. A father needs to leave a legacy. That's what I try to do with Preston. All the time he wanted a whole bunch of Pop-Tarts. Can I take some on the road? I'm building a legacy, so I didn't care. I didn't care if he took four or five Pop-Tarts. Because we're building a, a relationship and a legacy. You know, Genesis 1, 3, Jesus, or God said, let there be light. Let there be illumination. Dads, grandpas, if you, if you dads are too late to do it to your kids, you can do it to your grandkids. Leave an illumination. Encourage them to follow the path that God has for them. I read a study from several large church organizations, and it goes like this. Number one, if a father does not, let's all say does not, go to church even if his wife, if his wife does. Only one child in 50 will be a regular church attender. This next one, please. Listen to this. If a father attends church, even if the mom don't, guess what? 66% of the children will go to church. See how, how important you dads are? You know... Steve, I haven't told you this, but when when uh, Jenny, I call her Jenny, Jenna, she don't like that. Jennifer had to miss a few Sundays. I know she come right on about all those kids. That's what a godly father does. If the father attends, even if the mom don't, 66% of the kids go to church. Now listen to this. When the father and the mother both attend church, 75% of the children will always be regular attenders. See how you fathers, you grandpas, how important you are, you affect future generations. My last research, I did uh, a research done by criminal investigators, psychiatrists, and psychologists. Listen to this. 63% of people, 60% of young people suicide are from fatherless homes. Let's say fatherless homes. Okay. Listen to this. 90% of runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children with behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. Thank you. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent chemical Abuse patients in drug treatment centers are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth in prison are from fatherless homes. Men, dads, young people, it's so important that you be, always be a godly father. Always have a godly influence in your home. I'd like all the all the dads to stand up, grandpas, dads, please stand. Okay, we have any young men here that'll, that'll be a dad someday. Okay, all right. I want y'all to come up here. I want to pray for you, all you guys. Just line up across the front here. <clears throat> I want you to look at these guys. You know some churches this size only have women. Paul 
Foster, Bob, Steve, Dave, forgot. Richard. Got it. Richard, Terry, Brian, Bill, and Bill. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so I'm sure there's times that some of you don't feel like coming up here or getting out of your bed and even coming to church. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm telling you, you go to church this size, and I guarantee you won't hardly find but three guys there. I just want I'm gonna say I'm proud. Let's give these guys a good hand. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Lord, for the power of the Spirit. And Father, I just thank you that you are empowering these guys, empowering these grandpas to always be a godly example. May the, the grandpas, the grandkids of these grandpas never hear grandpas being mean to grandma. Only being a godly influence. May all you grandpas, you dads, when you talk to your kids, Encourage them to follow the path that God has for them. They may not follow your path. Just like Keith Pritchard didn't. He wanted to be a trucker, but he followed what his dad said. The good advice his dad gave him. Now he's the owner of three banks. Lord, I thank you for the empowerment of these dads. Bless them abundantly. May this week be a good week for them. May they hear something today, Lord, that will encourage their hearts to always be a godly father, a godly grandpa. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. James wasn't up here. James should have been up here. We, we included him. Mike. Are you a dad? You're not? No, okay. Well, we have some uh, generic coupons to give out to four dads today. Four dads. So, I'll tell you what. You come draw one. You got Steve. See if you can draw Steve out there. Okay. Here's a ticket that says three nine six two one three. And we might have had more tickets. Oh, it wasn't yours, Ellie. <laughs> I was kidding. Three nine six two one three. Okay. Star come draw one. Three nine six two one zero. All right. All right. <laughs> huh? We're trying to get Steve on here. here. This is 396212. Bill? Oh. His daughter's fixing lunch for them at uh, Harrisville today, so he had to leave by 12. Well, I'm getting them out ahead of time. And you don't even have to spend that. Maybe you want to buy something else. Today. So, got one more. One more. Two more. Okay. Uh, Tina, come see if you can draw your dad out of here. He'll give you a big hug if you get his there. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. 
11. Yeah, I forgot about her being here, Elizabeth. You can call Steve. I know you can. Thank you. Steve, do you have 396216? Oh. Brian, all right. <laughs> Where's Barbat? Maybe dinner's on Brian today, instead of you taking Brian out. <laughs> Kathy, come up here just a minute. Thanks for coming today, and we're going to believe for a good job for you. I want you all to stretch your hands towards Kathy. She needs a job. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know how to arrange it. You know what she needs. You know what works with her schedule. Thank you, Father. I just thank you that we'll get the news shortly that she found that she's in a better job than she had before. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. your nephew is that who's coming with us in a minute whatever instrument he plays play it bring it and come play with us okay bless you <laughs> I'm not fell <laughs> so, amen anybody else need prayer today let's all stand together it's been a good day amen several's out today but glad to see Richard and Sandra back Praise God. Been missing you guys. Bob and or Sarah was run off to Wyoming last week. Huh? Two weeks. But she's back all in a hole. One piece. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for a wonderful day today. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Love one another. See you next Sunday. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praises to your name I will bring. You are the mighty God. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of all kings. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praises to your name I will bring. You are the mighty God. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of You are the words and the music. Put it in here. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praises to your name I will bring. You are the mighty God. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of all. song that I see.